What's up, everybody? It's Caleb from thebookflipper.com. I have a very special guest with me. And if you can tell by looking at our shelves, we've got some new school books here. And our guest coming to you live from Florida is Steve Eisenstein. And he has the old school style. And so this is a new school meets old school kind of battle of the booksellers. And we're all going to learn a little bit from each other. So, Steve, thank you so much for giving up some of your time during quarantine and jumping on this interview with us. It's an absolute pleasure, Caleb. Um, I've been at it a long time. When I you get on my radio show, I always ask them, what got you started in the business? Well, I'll explain what got how I got started in the business and I'll also do a little bit of book selling history in the process. That, Going back into the late 60s, I had two friends that had a rare book business. I was in and out of town because I was going to school in Miami, and then I eventually lived in Miami Beach and so on. But when I would come in and out of town, they would have, we would be, you know, again, in the 60s, in the basement, shooting pool, drinking, other things, you know, the 60s. And they would have a magazine. This was the magazine. At that time, it was in a smaller uh, Reader's Digest or a TV Guide size format. This is a later issue. In that magazine, dealers would list books for sale. Okay. I would read the author's name, the title of the book, and make just. I used to be an entertainment director in hotels, and, you know, I always made a game out of things. So I would read the titles of the book and the abbreviations like 8VO. 8VO is the size of 8VOLS is volume. So I'd make a game, 8VO, VOL, and they would have to give me the price of the book. One day, and they would tell me about all these books back then. You know, 25 cents, 50 cents at a thrift shop. They were 20 bucks. They were 50 bucks. Sometimes, if you're lucky, it's worth a thousand dollars. You know, back then, the Great Gatsby was fifteen hundred dollars. Today, it's two hundred thousand. So, I'm dating myself. And we'll talk about fruition. So, basically, that's how it started through osmosis. But the one thing that I noticed about it, and I still say that today, 52 years in the field, it is unmasterable. If you, you know, I thank you for the compliments you gave me in the introductions. Um, if I know 1% of it, I'm 70. If I make it, God willing, until 90, and I put another 20 years in, I may know 1% of what there is today. <laughs> And just to give you another little, yeah, it's true. It's unmasterable. That was the thing that I know about it right away. And, you know, we all heard stories, you know, our grandparents or your great grandparents, they used to have to walk to school barefooted in the snow and all that. Well, let me tell you how books were sold in a capsulized statement in pre computer days. You subscribe to this magazine. I showed you the books that people listed for sale. Besides, they had trade articles uh, every week. This came out weekly. These were books by eight and a half by 11 page, what their title, that you had to remember. Remember, or have an index card system that they were looked through. But the gist of it, it was, and I actually found this in these books this is a book by william jennings bryant and this is how books were sold in the past on a postcard you mailed the postcard you maybe a hundred other people maybe three other people they mailed the card and well what lag time here okay and a description of it eventually you got a check it took six to eight weeks to sell a book Close the transaction. So that's the history of it. Yeah. So the the internet has changed what quite. For you, go ahead. I say the internet has changed quite a bit of the process of finding and selling and doing auctions and consignment. Um, let me back up just a minute. So Steve has had me on his radio show. We'll do a little plug. I know he doesn't like to plug his own thing, so I'm going to plug it for him. But Steve runs a. a is it weekly or monthly? No, every Saturday. Every Saturday. Every Saturday. I've been a guest on it two or three times now. It's every called day. 
Buck's on the bookshelf. You can Google that and come up with the radio show. You can listen to past archived episodes and you can then tune in live uh, via the internet as well. So that's a great uh, resource for you as you're looking to figure out you know, who Steve is and learn more about old books. I also did a Google search, Steve. I'm going to share this. Uh, I found an article you wrote for the Washington Post back in 1984. Do you remember this article? Yeah. Okay. I lost you. I mean, we're back to audio visual. Yeah. I got on. I used to have a publisher parish. Jag. In the years that I realized my entertainment director. I think we might have some lag issues here, Steve. The career was on I did pre-computers. It also got published in the American Farm Journal, the Washington Post, Dozens of the Washington Post. It did one of their way that I was being and that's the bit I paid for the story, but I'm so happy. We're having a are we okay on what are you here? I think we're all right. There's a little bit of a lag. I, I think the internet's not as strong on your end uh, as it could be, but we'll be all right. We'll get through it. Okay, I just want to make sure I, I you know, I, I was following you as best I could, but it looks like I did it. Um, let me let me start talking about some of the things that we would cover in this seminar. So you're all out there, you find your gate of books, and there's a bunch of, I think everybody referred to it as a dead pile or books that you have to research that you're not sure, um, and you're not going to find them, um, and, you know, unless you will talk about pricing and how to do that in a little bit. But let's start out with identifying different parts of a book. Some of this is really basic. Maybe some of you already know it, some of you don't. But the way you describe books on Amazon is not necessarily the way the same book described in a dealer's catalog of common and rare outer print books. I hate the word used. Let me get that out of the way. Common, rare, outer print books. So here is let me get it in the sweet spot there we go here is a leather bound book so let's talk about some of the words associated with this leather bound book this is the spine of the book the spine has raised bands these are the cords that bind the book together and they're covered by the raised bands this, all of these are called compartments. So this is a compartmentalized spine. To find, look at it and you can see there's scuffing. That's a word you want to use to describe in leather, scuffing. Is the label present and clear? Are the decorations in the compartments clear? In the terms of at the bottom, at the heel over here, obvious scuffing. So, you know, chipping at the leather in this case. So, this is the spine, raised bands, professional wording for it, compartments, or a compartmentalized spine. Okay, this would be a quarter leather band book. Sometimes it's half, sometimes it's full. These are leather corners, so you would call these corners bumped because you can see, let me get my left to right here, you can see where these books have been used, read, loved, and all that, but it causes bumping and scuffing. Okay, what's another part of the book? Well, let me get myself oriented here. Okay, the book opens on a hinge. There's an inner and outer hinge, so one of the areas that often and has a defect in it is the hinge area. Is the hinge cracked? Is the hinge going? Is the hinge gone? What kind of repairs does it need? And so on. These are end papers. There's a group, if you like end papers in books, there's a group called We Love End Papers on Facebook. These are marbleized decorative end papers. Now, if you have a leather bound book, 
you want to look, whoop, let me get myself on screen here, you want to look where this leather folds over. Whatever leather mound book you have, it's an older book, you want to look along this leather fold. You want to look carefully, sometimes stamped or even disguised in decorations that might be in that little overlapping strip of leather could be the binder's name. And a binder's name can make a difference like Picasso and your next door neighbor's painting at an art fair. Depends on who bound it. That's one of the places you can find a binder's stamp. Okay, this is the paste down end paper, the one that's attached to the front cover. This is called the front free end paper. These are important. If these are not there, you've got to note the defect. See the little brown spot when I can get the lighting right? This is called foxing. You're going to see this pretty much so in a lot of older books. We're in Florida, so you see it too much. You describe your foxing, spotted, gross, light. You know, sometimes a page might have foxing and another one doesn't. So, you know, you've got to do it. Uh, you've got to be able to describe that. This is called the half title page of the book. Not every book is going to have a half title page, but if it calls for it and it doesn't, you have a problem with the major defect. Again, blanks. Blanks are actually important and in older books are counted. Now, this is called the frontispiece illustration. Not every book has one. But it's a major problem if your book is supposed to have one and does not. Okay? Now, so that's the parts of the book. There's many more parts. There's the top edge, the bottom edge, all kinds of other parts. You've got to be able to familiarize yourself with the parts of a book. Um, ABCs of Book Collecting by Carter, a similar title, but the illustrated version, ABCs of Book Collecting by Berger. Um, those are good books to build your vocabulary. When I was in high school, a biology teacher told us the only difference between you and us, you in the classroom and a doctor, is that the doctor is master of vocabulary and the practical implementations of the usages of those words. Learn the vocabulary of the book and start using the words in your catalog description. Okay. And let me let me jump in here real quick, Steve. That was a that was a great overview. I used to sell it. You got to be. Go ahead, Caleb. Yeah, sorry. There's a little bit of a lag, so we'll just have to have to deal with that, guys. If you are uh, watching here, we've got yeah, we've got some people on Facebook as well as on YouTube. So thanks for being here. Go ahead and hit that like button, and then let us know if you have questions. We'll be pausing the interview a few times, and then at the end, we'll take a bunch of questions as well. Um, and I used to sell medical devices. So I used to sell hip and knee replacements and did marketing. We used to do what was called sales school and we would bring in sales reps from all around the country for two weeks at a time. We'd fly into lovely Warsaw, Indiana and spend two weeks uh, just trying to drill as much information about our product into their heads. And where did we start? We always started with the anatomy and we spent two or three days just making sure they understood the anatomy of the hip and the knee and the muscles and the ligaments and the bones and everything that was related to it. Because if you didn't have a grasp on the anatomy, you were lost as we got into the rest of the discussions. And so this is really important for booksellers. You know, too often we get a book and we say, you know, typical book and use condition, uh, you know, very good or good condition. And that's it. The more you can be educated and understand what what we're looking at the gutters and the hinges and the everything that steve's going to cover that's going to make you just stand out just a little bit more from the average bookseller who's just selling widgets so that's why we're doing it and uh, steve i'll turn it back over to you and keep going through the anatomy and then we'll get into some other fun stuff as well absolutely and i will follow the lag time on the next break i promise you that one <laughs> okay <laughs> all right so we were talking about in order to describe something you know, in order to sell something, you have to be able to describe it. All right. One of the things that I see a lot is lazy descriptions. If you want to sell a book, a rare book, a good out-of-print book to a collector, that collector is used to seeing a standard bibliographic format for the description of that book. So tell you know, say this one slow, 
I would suggest you copy it down if you're not familiar with it, because this is really important. The first thing you want is the author of the book. The next thing you want is the title of the book. And I just have to say this. We get a lot of phone calls. Hi, I have these books. I want to sell them to you. Um, if you ever call a book dealer, just give them the title of the book. Don't read the subtitles. It drives us crazy. But I say that tongue in cheek. So you want to know the author of the book. You want to know the title of the book. The next thing you want to know is the city of publication. Now, sometimes you're going to see London, Rome, Paris, like not my business card, but you get what I'm saying. The city of publication is usually the first city listed to the left or the one on top. So if it's New York, London, New York. If it's London, New York, London. The reason that's important, and we're going to talk about fiction in a little bit, because that's probably the hardest thing for you to understand and one of the easiest for me to explain. Um, there's a thing called rule of flags. Rule of flags is simply this. If it's the American edition of Harry Potter, it's not worth as much as the British edition of Harry Potter because she was a British author. Rule of flags. Okay, so going back to it, author, title, city of publication the year of publication okay now sometimes in a book we're going to do a little pretending otherwise i would have to have twenty thousand books in front of me for each example let's pretend on the title page of this book the year is what it is 1866 okay and also get this into your head this is a this is a rule number one age has nothing to do with the value of a book okay so the year on this title page is 1868 let's pretend that back here was one of those statements where my in the where where this finger is nope whoa come on why am i getting dyslexic here oh okay okay on on this oh, shit. I'm sorry, folks. This is almost funny. This is like an outtake. On that blank page, you would see the copyright statement. Entered into the year, the Act of Congress, 1857. Well, if you have 1857 on the enter of the Act on the verso, the back of the title page, and you have 1868 on the front, you do not have the first edition. Moving it into a more modern example, if you had 1936 in the copyright statement, and 1949 is the edition year on the title page, you don't have the first edition. All right, so let's go back up a little bit. Author, title, city year of publication, the most current year. Then the edition. Now, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. We're going to talk about edition. I don't want to segue again. We'll talk about edition identification shortly. Author, title, city, year, edition. What edition is it? Is it the first, if you know, the second, a limited edition? Is it a numbered limited edition, like one of a, you know, 238 of a thousand? Or is it a stated, unstated limited edition, one of a thousand? So we need to know that. Author, title, city, year, edition, and then condition. Okay. Now, condition guidelines. I would use the ABAA guidelines and the Antiquarian Book Dealers Association of America. I'd use their guidelines for condition standards. All right. I promised you I would cure first editionitis. So let's start talking about first editions in a couple of different ways. Let's start out. Um, and let me just do one other thing with parts of a book and I'll incorporate it. I showed you a leather bound book. This is a modern first edition book. There's a word called points. Points are things that differentiate different editions of certain books, okay? Publishers over the years have not made it easy to identify their first editions. I got out of sync here for a second. Let me just run this over. The dust jacket. The dust jacket is... 95% of the value of a fiction title. It's important in nonfiction, but it's seriously important in fiction. 
Publishers over the years have made it very difficult to identify their first edition. In some cases, before 1929, they have no idea. When you get a book like this, there are many of them, and I would recommend that this one you might not find so easily, but the title says it all, okay? There's this title by Zemple, Z-E-M-P-L-E. There's another title by Tannen, Jack Tannen, How to Identify First Editions of Today. Why do you need this book? In 1929, publishers realized that they did not have a system to identify the first editions of their books. And like a light switch, they all adapted a system in 1929. I historically jokingly say too bad they didn't consult Henry Ford at the time because they should have all done the same thing, but they didn't. So where I was saying, let's pretend in a book, let's do this. Let's say this book was a Scribner publication. On the back of the title page, you would be looking for God, why am I getting so crazy with this? I cannot find my way. I'm lost in the mirror. Oh, you're good. It's Everything's backwards, Steve. Right so just here. try and move it over to your left shoulder. Okay, right there. You would be looking at the title on the back of the title page on a Scribner's first edition for a little parentheses with the letter A in it. If you had a book by Doubleday, you would be looking for the word first edition here. So you've got to read these books on how to identify the edition to really know it. But it's very important. Doubleday has first edition. Scribner's has an A. There's an older company called Appleton Century. Some of you may have seen some of their books. If you go into the last page of printed text in that book, There'll be a parentheses on the bottom of the page. Whatever number is in that parentheses is the edition of your book. When a book is printed, any book is the first edition of that book. In novels, and this is where you really got to pay attention to it. This is where you're throwing away potential sleeper money by looking at it as every novel is a dud. All it takes is one or two what I would call A-list books that you could potentially find in a dust jacket, and you could have thrown away four or five, six thousand dollars easily. So there are a lot of two and three thousand dollar books out there. I'm not saying you're going to find them, but I would hate to find out afterwards that you threw one away. Um, the trick to knowing that is this. It's usually the household word authors. Again, pre-1980 authors, because the way publishers published at the time after 1980 there's too many first editions and there's not a lot i'm not saying there aren't any but more of the sleeper fiction titles are going to be pre-1980 than post you've got to learn like the hemingway fitzgeralds the faulkners the joyces the sci-fi writers of those time periods and a trick to it is, if you look in the front of one of their books, there's usually a list of all their titles. The earlier title, the first title in a fiction writer's genre you know, John or in their repertoire is usually their most desirable one. But then again, there's exceptions. James Joyce wrote Ulysses, uh, you know, the limited editions of Ulysses and the uh, artist illustrated editions of Ulysses or something else, uh, in, again, in the thousands of dollars. Now, there's a word called points. Points refer to things that have changed in the printing of a book. By example, the first edition of James Agee's A Death in the Family is a book that has two points. The title page has to be printed in blue and black, and on page 80, the first word in the first edition should be waking. And the next words are in the middle of the night. So the mistake identifies with the blue and black title page the first edition. The correction identifies the second edition. That is referred to as points. Points could be numerous in a book. Some books could have no points. 
and some books could have like a Dickens book. You might have to look it up 20 points. A book like The Great Gatsby. If you look up a description of The Great Gatsby, a proper edition of that in the first edition, there's 10 or 11 points, including the dust jacket. If you get a feel for that, then you will truly understand points. And I wish you find the book. The last copy that went in auction with a dust jacket was $200,000. So, you know, there's a lot of money in the fiction titles. Don't take them for granted. They've got to be pre-1980. They've got to be household word authors. And they've got to be the first edition. Now, there's another point about first editions. You can see the word first edition in more modern books. And then you see a string of numbers or a string of letters. That's very easy. First edition, first printing, the number one has to be in the string. If your string starts out with two, it's the second, three, four, etc. If you have the letter A in the string of letters, then you have the first edition. What I would recommend to learn about these titles, auction catalogs are free online. I am pretty much so self-taught in this business. Um, one of the things that I had to teach me was the AB. That stage of learning is long gone, and many people in the book is said amen to it. I was not one of them, but that's another story. Um, but my computer illiteracy is, is a victim of that, too. Um, read dealer catalogs. We used to have to pay for them. They're online. Read, you know, fiction catalogs of uh, specialty dealers in first edition fiction or sci-fi, mystery, sci horror, sci-fi, any of the fiction genres. That's the best thing you can do. And I will tell you the same thing with nonfiction. We'll talk about nonfiction and how to hunt and all that. But I hope that clears up first edition. Just because the book says first edition doth not make it a valuable book. It has to be the right author, title combination, the dust jacket is everything. So, you know, at that point, Caleb, I'm going to ask, are there any questions specific or other questions in general? Yeah, we've got a couple questions that are popping up uh, in and general. While we're waiting for Sure. I'm just showing you, this is a $600 fiction title. Uh, no, I have it up. I have it upside down. But if you ever see this, the shiny dust jacket, a good price on this today, four to 600 bucks, depending on condition. Go ahead. Yeah. So talk through a little bit of the first edition or the first printing. I'll, I'll try and see if I can uh, show that okay without the lighting. So you see that string of numbers down there, right? A lot of, a lot of books have these strings of numbers. Usually, like, you know, it's like counts backwards from nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Can you see that okay? Might have lost you. There you go. Can you walk us through? Does does the first printing mean anything different than just the first edition as well, in addition to what you've been talking about? All right, might have gotten a little laggy. Hello, hello, hello. I'm not hearing you, Caleb. Here we go. I, you're All right. making the correct comment. The first edition. The first edition. Second print. Let me let me pick up. Let me go go into another area. I think that would um, people would appreciate in terms of for and This is kind of an oral presentation. Um, I would have 500 books in front of me if I tried to go through all of it. But I've done this description for a long time. Take some notes. It'll all make sense. There's a lot of common themes. Yep. We've talked about fiction. I think I've sent you in the right direction. Nonfiction to me is my favorite. I am sold The Great Gatsby, but I never read it, okay? <laughs> um, but in my nonfiction, um, I love it. So let's start out with this. Three subject matters that are very related. Art, architecture, and photography. What do you look for in those books, and what are you not looking for? In art books, the key thing that makes a great art book is one of two subject areas. It's either loaded or has a couple of good lithographs in it, 
or what they call a catalog resume, the complete works of an author. In art books, you want anything where the artist is doodled on the end paper. You're looking for magazines that if you don't know them by eye, they're going to be very deceptive and you'll be passing on thousands of dollars. The art magazines that you might know about, if you ever come across them, are Verve, V-E-R-V-E. -E. There are double issues with like, you know, multiple lithographs by Chagall that go for thousands of dollars and pick your other favorite modern artist that might have done lithographs that, you know, Picasso, uh, George Klee, Brock, Kandinsky, it goes on. Verve, another Derrière Le Mirror, also an art magazine with lithographs. Now, this one is a deceptive looking magazine. It's 20, it's called 20th Century Cycling. It's a French title. XX is what's on the cover of it. Again, a magazine with a shiny cover that almost looks like it's a hardcover magazine, but a shiny cover. You'd almost pass on it if you, you know, saw it in a stack of magazines in the living room. So it's 20th century cycling. Another one. There's only 10 editions of it. And I think you mentioned this one, Caleb, that you had it. Aspen. Um, Aspen, for lack of a better terminology, if you, if you remember what carbon paper is, um, Aspen came in a box that was exactly the size of a carbon paper box. But the things inside the box were, you know, artistic toys made by Andy Warhol and the other nine artists that they did in the 10 series run of it. So in art, you want the more, like in the same, we're gonna, you're going to hear this a lot, the more specific, the better. You want the lithographs, you want the catalog resumes. You want individual works about individual artists, but you don't want the art of the world or these more modern books unless you have a market for them. I, you know, I'm talking about when I'm talking about art books, I'm generally talking about pre 1980 art books. Um, some of the more modern ones. Yes, there is one I have here that absolutely knocked my socks off. I used to live in a cabana on the oceanfront in the 60s when I was in Miami Beach. And I bought this because I had a black light in the cabana when you lit it up. And I thought that's all it was going to be was a fun nostalgia trip. That book turned out to be, in the condition I have it in, a $750 book. So even, excuse me, so even I, after all these years, you know, will suddenly look at something in an art book and get shocked out of it. I was laughing. I never would have looked that up in older days, you know. Um, and it was published around 2000. So art books, you want catalog resumes, books with lithographs, books where the artists have doodled or executed something extra in the book. Architecture, the same thing. Monographs, another word for art books too. Monographs, you want a singular book about a singular artist. And the same thing with photography books. Now, I'm going to teach you a little trick that may or may not help you one day. Photography, the same thing. Monographs on major photographers. Henry Cartier-Bresson, Steichen, Weston, Strand, Steiglitz. It goes on and on. This is Ansel Adams' book, okay? This is a signed, limited edition, but it's signed in the book plate, okay? Nothing really special in the condition it's in. You know, it's got the value of the book and the signature, you know, 50, 60 bucks, whatever. But this book had an original photograph that was laid into the back of the book. Where I bought the book, there was no way of finding the photograph. But if you are at an estate sale and you find a book like that, look around on the walls to see if that photograph got hung on the walls. And I would tell you the same thing. Look around the walls. If you find an art book missing lithographs, maybe they're there, and hopefully they were taken out the right way. So to review it, art, architecture, photography, Difference in value between artists when alive or folk? Ah, uh, well, yeah, okay. Any famous artist that dies, it's a, I hate to talk about it this way, but any famous artist that dies is, of course, going to be worth more 
when they, you know, pass, you know, it passes away. I'm, you know what I'm saying? Any famous artist that's alive and well, and their product, their, their works are selling for great money, it's going to be worth more money when they die. Yes. I hope that answers the question. When alive or dead, absolutely there is. Uh, dependent on who the artist is and so on and so forth. Or it depends on what the appreciation factor would be. Uh, it's supply and demand. I will tell you right now, obviously, you know, um, it's a really bad time to be selling. Um, I, you know, I don't know what prices are going to do. Um, I hear a lot of people online are doing well. That's great. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm very lucky. I do a lot of appraisal work. So anyway, let's talk about another set of subject matters that kind of run together and they're popular. Hunting, fishing, firearms, archery. In hunting books, you want big game in exotic places. And you, again, pre-1980, not to say from 1980 to 2000, there aren't some Amwell press books and the reprint Derry Dales are so-so. The original Derry Dales, well, the market was killed for the original limited edition Derry Dales from Long Island in the 1920s when that was reprinted. I'm sure those of you in the new book area have seen the reprinted Derry Dales limited edition hunting and sporting books. But if we're talking about, again, pre-80 and again with hunting and fishing, preferably earlier than pre-80, you want big game in exotic places, lions in Africa, tigers and Indians, by well-known big game hunters, guides, or even some that aren't so well-known. Um, but big game in exotic places, fishing, Zane Gray fishing books, even the Grasset and Dunlap reprints of the Harper first editions are collectible. Now, firearms books, I'm a certified rifle, pistol, and shotgun instructor. They have a close place in my heart, and I used to do gun shows where we could trade firearms books for anything we wanted at the show. Those days are long gone, but there is still a great demand for the right to firearms books, and like anything else, I'm pretty much still going to be telling you about nonfiction books. And I hope you're getting the message. The more specific, the better. You don't want the guns of the world. You want the three-volume set on the Luger handgun, even though there are mistakes in that book and everything else, but there's mistakes in every book. You want the history of the Remington rifle, one of a thousand by Whitaker. The more specific, the better. And edge weapons, edge weapons. Yeah, thank you. Edged weapon books, almost anything on edged weapons is really going to be a good book. Archery earlier is better. Okay, and another subject matter, military history. Age has nothing to do with the value of a book, but earlier is better in some cases. So again, when I'm talking about military history books, in most cases, I'm talking about pre-1980. Um, it's a strange way to talk about war, but then again, we just talked about life and death and how it affects somebody's signature. So let's get weirder. Um, military history. The way I like to focus on that is by wars, starting out with a quick trip through the American Revolution. Anything you find written during or just after the American Revolution, Stedman's two volumes said, you probably get $8,000 for that, and there's all kinds of other ones. Anything from that time period, 17, 1800s, where you're talking about folio, big sized books with plates of embankments, fortifications, weaponry, um, you know, the ancient weaponry, trebuchets, and things like that. Uh, those are very collectible. Move forward, um, Spanish American Wars and other earlier Wars, 1814 and such, um, collectible. But where the real collectors that are in volume start is at the Civil War. Last time I read this figure was about 20 years ago, and over 100,000 books had been published about the Civil War since it. Okay, most of the books that are very, very desirable are printed during or just after the Civil War. Not all of them, but most of them. And the ones that are more desirable in those are the ones that are southern imprints when they were printed printed south of the Mason-Dixon line, where they bury the survivors, you know, that joke. 
Um, so military history, Civil War. World War I is not all that collected, but it is. And in both in any other war, there is something called a unit history or a regimental. In the Civil War, it's called a regimental. In World War I and up, it's called a unit history. And that's the history of like the 104th Volunteers of Pennsylvania or this air group or that air group, you know, unit history during World War I. During World War I, unit histories are collectible. Other things are too, but they don't bring in as much a dollar value as later wars. And the one thing that excels in that area is anything on early military aviation. Find some of these biographies of the Lafayette Escadrille. Find something even luckier sign. You know, those books very collectible. There's an area called fine press books. If you find them in a Gaylord, I hope they come in big numbers. Fine press books are these gorgeous things when you look in museums. They're beautiful bindings and things like that. They come with exotic names like Dove, Ashendi, so on and so forth. If you ever find this book, the prices in it are useless, okay? But if you find something in the 80s or 90s, read it like an encyclopedia because you'll learn the names of all kinds kinds of presses and other things as you go through it. And it's kind of interesting to learn the vernacular and other things. The abbreviations are still the same. Um, it just teaches you a lot. If you ask me for a one volume absolute, this is the best reference ever, it would be this book, um, just because it covers a little bit of everything. And I... Um, it's got a bibliography in it, anything you might want um, in that sense. Caleb, are you trying to come in here? Yeah. You uh, recommended that on the radio show a couple of weeks back, so I went and no, bought, okay. I went bought an older version of it. But um, no, Okay, I'll keep going to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, transportation. Yeah, that's the book, Ahern. Uh, it gives you values that you have to learn to interpret. But it does give specific points for many of the books that you would want to find. And truth be told, there's a forerunner to that book called Van Allen Bradley's. Okay, when that book, when this book came out, when the ones from years before and years after and Ahern's came out, I literally read the book from cover to cover. And I'll tell you something else. One day I stopped at Virginia Woolf. And had I not known about Virginia Woolf, because like I said, fiction wasn't my thing, and this was in the earlier years, I would have missed a book by, called Hours in the Library, because that was the last book I read about and the first book I found on the hunt the next day. <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> you're going to jump into some other categories, but we have a couple good questions coming through, so let's, let's tackle those. We've got sure. uh, Mike Resendis asking, if you have an old book where you don't recognize the author or title, what kind of attributes or what stands out about that book that makes you want to research it further? Okay, well, okay. There's an answer to that question. There's something called the Dictionary of Pseudonyms, Acronyms, and Other Things. Um, I have a two-volume set from the 1890s. Arco did a seven-volume set a few years ago. Um, I don't know how easy it is to find it right now. But in that book, there are clues on the title page that can be answered in some of those books. Like it says, um, you know, it gives you the title, and it goes by HH. You know, well, you know, Halida do HD. I mean, we all would know at that point it's Halida do little, but HH might be somebody else. Or it says by the author of, by the author of, and it gives you the title of the other book. So you would do a title. You can tell you online. You know really need those books. I'm sorry, I'm stuck in books for reference. Uh, Google the author, by the author of, what is the title of the book that they listed for that author? Google that title and, you know, it should be the same author. Um, it's a great question. It's pseudonyms, nom de plumes, and other things, you know, and, and it's an advantage to know those because sometimes in some of the pulp magazines, they have the first appearance in writing of somebody famous was under a nom de plume. So if you can spot that, that helps. Does that kind of answer your question? 
Yeah, that's part of it. Reezy comment if you have a follow up there. So the again, most of us in the modern bookseller area are using a barcode scanner and an app and they're scanning the books ISBN or the barcode and we're looking up the values and that works great on anything after you know 1980, for example. Um, the trick is we all come across older books, whether it's in thrift stores or bulk purchases or estate sales. And we see these old books and, you know, on one hand, we know that, sure, they're old. There's probably some value. They're probably rare. On the other hand, I don't have the first clue where to go to try and figure out the value. And that's the purpose oh, of the wow. seminar here is when, how do you like develop that spidey sense to know, hey, this book is probably worth looking up more? By reading all those dealer catalogs, you know, familiarity breeds understanding. You know, I mean, you've got to be able to look and read at those dealer catalogs. But in answer to your question for an online answer, um, on my phone, I have add all. Uh, you can put other things on your phone and you could just simply, you know, as a matter of fact, to go back to Reezy's initial question, go to a site like Via Libri or go to a site like add all and just do the title search for that book. Um, you know, it gives you that opportunity. Those are dealer prices. So I'm sure you all know that some of those sites, a Biblio, Via Libri, Add All, those are all free. They're all conglomerate sites that list dealer prices. So this is the trick in knowing when the price is right. Dealer prices fluctuate. So, you know, yes, you can take out the highest and throw out the lowest and come up with a middle if there's enough information for you to do it. Another way is to selectively choose whose, re whose reference you're going to take for the comparable. Does that dealer have a reputation? You know, do they have letters after their name as an antiquarian? Because they're not going to, you know, in most cases, they're not going to put an embarrassing price in one direction or the other. But I will tell you this, and this is required if. If you walked into a house and you wound up or a gaylord from heaven full of antiquarian books, and I'm talking about, you know, stuff that looks like this, stuff that looks like this, stuff that looks like this in a vellum binding. I'll tell you all about all those in a few minutes. But you would have to subscribe and it's a pay for subscription to the rare book hub they have a monthly the rare book hub is auction records the problem with dealer listings is you don't know if they sold at that price and by example i'm a dealer there's a 20 percent reciprocal if you give me i give you at book fairs dealer discount so if I have a book at $1,000, and I, let's say I listed it somewhere for 1000 but I sold it at the show for 800 to another dealer, I sold that book at, you know, for $800. Everybody thinks I sold it for 1000 The other classic mistake I would advise everybody not to make, don't try and copy the highest dealer's price on the lot. Oh, so-and-so in England had that, or so-and-so in New York had it listed at that. They have something that you don't have yet. That's a client list that will pay those prices. And I'll give you a great example of an actual story of what's the book worth, okay? A dealer I know three years ago <clears throat> was in Massachusetts, bought a first, uh, bought the modern library edition of The Great Gatsby in a dust jacket. Signed by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now, I only know this because I was told the story. F. Scott Fitzgerald hated the inscription in that book. So not only did F. Scott Fitzgerald sign and date it, but he wrote on the, on the, intro, in the introduction. He hated the introduction to the book. I'm sorry. Hated the introduction to the book. And he signed the inscription on the introduction page. I hate this introduction. Wow, what a what a unique thing to have. The dealer that he bought it from wanted $5,000, and they got it. Two weeks later, he sold it to a New York dealer for, it was either 17 or 18, five, as in 1,000. And about a year and a half later, the same guy that bought the book was walking around the New York book fair, and he saw his book, and you know, there's not going to be two of those, he saw his book in an upscale 
dealer's booth from overseas at $62,000. What's the book worth? I don't know. What's the book worth? Did it sell? But you can't get those prices unless you have the clients for them. Um, that, you know, and, and sometimes a client for a book hasn't been born, um, which is sometimes why when we explain what we pay for books, um, we'll use a sliding scale based on what that book's place is in the market. So let me continue on with a couple of other topics. Americana. Americana, Western Americana, those are things like cowboys, Indians. You find a book from the 1940s or 50s on cattle brands, you might be very surprised what that book is worth. You find certain books written about the King Ranch um, in modern times. Some of those are very collectible. Anything in that green um, binding with gilt title on it by the Bureau of American Ethnology on Indian tribal customs from A to Z, very collectible. Um, anything on cowboys, Indians, good guys, bad guys, good girls, bordellos, anything like that um, by the, in, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s in Western Americana titles are very good. Earlier is even better. Um, if the book calls for maps and plates, I hope they have them all because that's as bad as a missing dust jacket on those kind of books. Um, let me throw in something about magazines that might save you all a little bit of time. I told you about the art magazines, Verve, Derrier, Lemurur, 20th Century, Cycli, Aspen, National Geographic. Look, if you have the room and you have the location to sell them as birthday issues, you know, there's a category for them. The ones from the 20s might go for 15, 20 bucks. The ones from the 70s might go for 8 to 15 and all of that. But that's all they are worth. There's very little in National Geographic except the ephemera that they created that has a lot of value. All the money on National Geographic's is in volume one, issue number one, through the first other issues. Um, I once was involved in the sale of the first edition of National Geographic. Um, and at that time, this must have been 20 years ago, at that time, every one of them in one room was worth about $175,000. And if I had my choice of the first 20 issues, that 175 would be, you know, you can't sell it for anything because all the money is in volume one, number one. I'm not saying it's a rule of thumb, but it's a good rule to remember most magazines. If you see volume one, number one, it's worth taking a shot on. But there are magazines that, you know, sometimes like Ernest Hemingway did a five volume appearance in some motor magazine or something. So that becomes collectible. You know, there's always exceptions to the rules on those things. Um, how about questions to this point? Um, any other? Yeah, let me pop up a couple. Any other questions? Yeah, so in general, if we had to boil it down. I want to cover, but I want to stay with what you guys want to hear. Yeah, if you guys have questions, drop those below. I'll be asking a few of them. But in general, kind of the same rules that we talk about if you're looking just with your eyeballs instead of with a barcode scanner is the weirder, the better, the more niche, the better or niche, if you prefer to say it that way. But the riches are in the niches. And so be looking for those specific things. If you find an old book, old doesn't necessarily mean valuable. It still has to have a market for it. So an old textbook, for example, probably not worth your time. Throw it away. Um, Reezy mentioned something, maybe the prettier the book, if it's got marbling on the edges of those pages. Steve, hold up that book just on your left. I think there was a pretty good example of marbling on the edges of those. Uh, oh, sure. For sure. Let me just give it a stretch here. Hold on a second. Yeah, there's something else. And I the last time I showed it, I broke it. But I, I and I don't want to do it. Again. There's something I love showing at seminars. It's called a four painting. So let me show you an illustration of one. And I'll show you how you find out. This is the four edge of a book spread properly. When you close that book, all you're going to see is a gilt edge okay what you have to very carefully do 
is, and I can, I'm going to do it because I don't have to be really careful with this book, but, and we're also going to have to do a little bit of use your imagination. If this was a gilt edge of a book and you closed it and had a four edge painting, you wouldn't see it. But what you want to do is carefully lay the book on a table so you have everything inside in your hands like this. You put it down on a table carefully and you want to kind of bend it like this to gently spread the edges. Do it this way and do it the other way. Something You've got to pop it the right way. Now, if your book does have a four edge painting, check the top and bottom because sometimes the four edge can wrap around. If there's not another specific question, there's something I mentioned several times that I'd like to cover before it gets away. And that's a couple of things. One is, if you have a, it's in a slip kit, this, always grab, do the work. Never pull the book out with your fingernails in that hinge area. Don't. You'll pull the spine off the book. Same thing. Let gravity put it in and out. Now, you all know about hair. Oh, by the way, just because. Here. this is It's right in front of me. I forgot I had it here. If you ever find this magazine, you got a $750 to $1,000 magazine. I had one other copy of it, and I had sold it years ago. That's what I got for it. It's a very magazine called the Miami Jewish Omnibusman. It was done in the 40s during a literary exposition. So you, you never know what kind of crazy things a regional magazine will bring. Okay. Sure. So slip cases, you saw how to take them in and out. All right. You all know Eastern Press. You all know the firm in those books. Before those books were popular, they had what they called the Limited Editions Club, which some of you may or may not know about. But what I'm sure you do know about is called Hedge Press. Okay, so this is a Heritage Press book. Let everything catch up to me here. We'll get this right. Okay, this is Heritage Press. It has the sand glass newspaper in it, and it says Heritage Press. Okay. If you looked in a Heritage Press book, you would have seen R.H. Macy's name somewhere in that book, because every book that was published by the Heritage Press was first published by the Limited Editions Club. An interesting story about it. Macy, being the department store, had a rare bookstore in it and a bookstore in it. During the 20s and 30s, publishers came out with a lot of limited editions. And in order to get those limited editions, they made Macy buy whatever he they had laying around of the trade edition of that book. Macy, being the famous businessman that he was, didn't like that and said, stuff it i'm going to make my own press and he did he made the limited editions club which was much finer than anything they ever did so the limited editions club books have a couple of things they all have this in common they are either limited to 1500 or 2000 copies they are all signed by Usually the illustrator or the author, if a living author. In this case, if you know the artist Miguel Covarrubias, this is one of the better limited editions club books. Um, they're all limited and numbered, which is that type of limited edition. This is number 262, I think, if I'm reading it the right way, upside down. Of, uh, no, number 352 of 1500. Sometimes you walk into a house, the number will be the same in every book because that family bought that book. This particular edition of the Limited Editions Club of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin is about 300 bucks. It's in fairly good condition, I wouldn't call it fine, but it's in good condition. 
most of the limited edition, limited edition club books come in somewhat of a set price range. They're either forty to a hundred dollars, one hundred and twenty dollars. There are a couple of hundred bucks up to six hundred, and then there's a few in the thousand. If you ever find Picasso's La Strada at the limited edition club, you've got a book in the thousands of dollars. James Joyce and Matisse hooked up to do Ulysses, and that's the only exception in the limited edition club. There's an edition of 1500, but in the edition of 100 within that 1500, Matisse and Joyce both signed them. So you're looking at book, you know, a book that is. Again, today's prices don't know, but it's gone in the six, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollar range at different times over its career so far, and that's quite a bit. So, limited editions club. Now you know why they started. They are a better version book of um, than the Heritage Press. They're worth more money. Um, why Macy started? It's a fun tidbit. And the other thing that I think I really, you know, we're going to talk about sign books also and a couple of other things. But one of the other things that's very popular that you may see are these kind of books where they are called the Scribner's Classics. Um, they usually have this kind of paste down picture on the front cover. Now, they all look something like this. You've all seen books like this. Different publishers do something similar, but if we're talking about Scribner's, the way you know the first edition of this book is very simple. The top edge of the book is going to be gilt, okay? These books, at least in South Florida, are very, this is not, this was not a first edition, but it had the Dutch jacket. They're very hard to find in dust jackets, at least the way we find them down here. Now, there's a big market in children's books, children's illustrated books like these, even the later printing sell. Um, children's series books, you'll see them all the time, the Nancy Drews, the Hardy Boys, the Boxcar Kids, all of those things. They're pretty much so the same across the board. What's a funny fact about the Nancy Drew is in the first run, in the first edition of them, the later ones, um, they printed less of. So some of those later ones are worth as much as some of the first early ones. And so children's series books, children's illustrated books are very collectible. Um, I could keep going. Give me another couple of questions. These are great. So you just answered the one about you just answered the one about uh, children's books. We've got a couple um, so questions. Many times we see people at book, excuse me, at book shows coming in and buying them for their children. You know, yes, on we read these. We were a kid. I mean, if you see a series of them, especially if they're in dust jackets, buy them. And if you see the oddball stuff like Grasset and Dunlap reprinted a lot of Tarzan and other things. But if you find E and D as in Grass and Dunlop, Tarzan's, Frank and Dunlop, Dracula, those very, very collectible in the dust jacket. Perfect. A couple other questions. Uh, Reezy asked, what's the most Caleb, expensive but... book you've ever sold in your collection? Um, well, the most expensive set, the most expensive sale I was ever involved in was two hundred thousand dollars. The most, the highest priced individual title was eighteen five. But you want to hear something funny? In my hand right here is a ninety five hundred dollar book. Um, that unfortunately, I'm trying to get you to. I got to be real careful. I broke a binding on the last seminar. But up in the corner, I think you can see ninety five hundred. And the Garrison Martin Rose is, yeah, I'm going to move that. Uh, Looks like we got a little buffer. It'll, it'll pop back up in a second. Just bear with us real quick here. If you guys have other questions while we're waiting for his uh, internet feed to catch up, let me know. Drop those below. Thanks for the questions coming through so far. I'm learning a ton, and hopefully this will add just another arrow to your quiver as you're out looking for books. Uh, those of you that do bulk books, set these aside 
and just dedicate a Saturday morning when you have some spare time and uh, just start looking these up online. Use adall.com, uh, Rare Book Hub if you want to pay for the subscription. You can look at eBay historical sales as well. Um, looks like we're going to jump back in. I think he's, he lost his other feed. But do the research. The more time you put in, the more you're going to understand and just you're just going to build that repository of knowledge in your brain that's then going to help you as you come across these in the future. All right. Does this stream work a little bit better, Steve? Hey, there we go. Dwayne, where do you go? There we go. All right, we're back. There we go. You you are a Yoda backstage there, Caleb. I know what you're doing there. Wow. So uh, <laughs> you are a technical guru. Okay, so what is this book? Anybody that ever had a nose job? I had 23 stitches in my nose when I walked through a plate glass door in Venezuela. This guy had to have read the book. This is the first book that was ever done on a successful nose transplant. Um, there's a few other color plate illustrations in it. Carpu was a noted physician. Um, what's really ironic about this book, and I'm not joking, I have two copies of it. The guy's collection was purchased in pre-computed days. Every once in a while he made a mistake. But I've had this book for two years. It is not an easy sale. Um, a copy that was signed by the author and one of the people that survived has an auction record of 20 grand. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens over time. It's not going anywhere. Um, but to have two copies is kind of a, a fun thing to be able to say. Uh, you never know what you're going to find, excuse me, at estate sales. So I tell you, you know, we wound up in a big medical library. After a while, you're looking at hundreds of books and you see this. Yeah, you know, you really want to do that? No. I was tempted to with this book and I kept it for that exact reason, to always illustrate it. Have patience. It shows up. This little thing, even in the trim size it is, is about 300 bucks. Um, you never know what you're going to find at sales. So if you have something on your phone, you know, um, it makes it worthwhile uh, for you to do that question. Any value to high on the wild with Hemingway signed by his son, John? Um, is it just signed? Um, I'm not familiar with Hemingway's son, John, on the other end of that. I would tend to think, unless you had a completist collector, and a completist is somebody that has to have one of everything, um, you know, it's not much. And I make a joke about it, not necessarily Hemingway's son. Sometimes an author's signature is worth more on a $5 check made out to you out there than it is in their book. Um, you know, so, you know, I, I would say this. If, if I don't know that book called, it sounds like a $15 to $40 book on a bookstore shelf. It's signed by the author, you know, a couple of dollars more for it. I can't see it being anything that would be a major, major signature compared to Papa's, um, you know. So there are many other subject areas to go through, but I, I impossible to them all. We still have some time. There's others that I noticed some question on, um, on Facebook earlier, what their signatures, okay? When you find a book like this, this is Oliver Lafarge's The Enemy Gods, nobody's really going to forge that signature. So in more modern books, or, you know, where the signature might be a multiple thousand dollar signature, I would say, you know, caveat emptor, but in most cases, when you're coming across a load of books and it's all signed. I don't think you have that much to worry about. Um, question, why aren't you... Oh, no, no, that's a good one. But Baron, let me tell you something that amazed me too about gloves. Very good question. I've been doing this 52 years. I would say about five years ago, I was made aware of just that gloves. The reason that you don't wear gloves and what fascinates people, somebody did the study, not so much what the study revealed, but somebody actually did the study that if you wear gloves, 
and you turn a page, you have more tactile touching and possibilities breaking a piece of the page off than you do with your fingers. What the current attitude has been for quite a while after this study has been done and accepted, wash your hands, make sure your hands clean. But that's not true photographs or other chemically composed you know, documents just for books, the way they used to use them in the library, it's no longer used because it's been proven dangerous. Let me throw one more thing in, and I can still throw a lot more in, but my wife just handed me this. This is miniature books, okay? You are looking at, you know, give a close-up on it. Each one of these was about $300 when we bought them. We bought them a while ago. They have hence appreciated as does the very special bookcase that comes with them. If you ever find miniature books, it's going to depend like a regular book on what they are. But there is the Miniature Book Society, and there is a site called Miniature Books Buy, Sell, Trade. If you ever find anything in miniature books, um, then that's a place for you to get reference. An example of something... Three, if you take a dollar bill and you do this to the dollar bill, see, I made it disappear. <laughs> if you do this to the dollar bill, that's the acceptable size. Two by three, you know, three by stretching it, four by four is out of the question, you know. But basically, that's it. The thing that's not accepted is when you start reading Guinness's book of record on how they made a miniature book with an electron microscope. Well, you know, the purists don't accept that figure. Anyway, why aren't my... So now I've told you why I'm wearing gloves. Other questions? Yeah, a couple other questions here, and then I'm going to steer the conversation just a little different direction as we come to the home stretch. Mark Corbett asks, what about Bibles, collective sure. Bibles? What do you know? How do you know if it's valuable? Okay. I used to say that about religious books. The only religious books I ever wanted were those that were written by monks on mountains in the 1400s, you know, in multicolors. Um, today, it's very different. Religious books, because of the end, found a tremendous market. So where I used to say 125-year-old religious books have no value, I don't say that anymore the market for them. There used to be no value and no market. Now there's both. But specifically to address your question on Bibles, if you looked in that book I showed you earlier, American Book Prices Current, you would see a section of just Bibles. Every Bible from Sanskrit to whatever. Most of your family Bibles do fit under that. They're not worth much unless family notes are historically important. That 1880s embossed big Bible that everybody finds in beautiful condition, which you usually don't find it in, with the brass clasps and all of that. An antique store charge three to five hundred. If I had to buy it, because I had to buy it in a library of books I really wanted, I would sell it for the first hundred or two hundred bucks that were offered to me for it. Other people might ask a little more. Three fifty is normal for fine one. If you ever find the brass case that was made for that, that's thousands of dollars. But other Bibles, yeah, even pages from Bibles. Sometimes in the nineteen twenties, like they took a part of Gutenberg. They got the Book of Esther in one particular case and made it into what they call leaf books. It's a book written about the book, like the Gutenberg Bible or something. And they have this actual leaf from the printing of that Bible, you know, the real deal. So the nine pages that made up the Book of Esther when it auctioned last two years ago for $920,000 just for those pages of a Gutenberg. The regular family Bible or the ones that you find in an estate sale, it all depends on the provenance of the family. You know, are they historically important? That's where your money is. So a couple other questions here. Junkman's asking, have you ever Another sold... Question. 
Have you ever sold old books to decorators? I have not. I know people that do. For example, my wife made my shelves beautiful here. We've got, you know, all the colors of the rainbow across the top. And then we've got kind of black and white underneath. So people do pay, especially for older stuff. You can sell it. I think they sell it by the inch or by the by the foot. And so you can sell three feet well, of there's a logo. word for that. There's a couple of words for that. Go for it. Leather by the yard. It's called leather by the yard. Okay. Varying prices depends on, you know, what. They used to, I don't know if they're still doing it. They used to ship over containers of books, Swedish, French bindings from old libraries that, you know, I mean, shipping them over here in the containers. It's for prop stores or things like that. Anytime anybody ever came up to me over the years, with a substantial, I'm talking about two or three foot or, you know, a little brass bookcase. They want red, blue, and green or whatever. And nobody ever came through for the deal once they heard the price. The formula, your average 12 inches of bookshelf, unless you're talking about really thick books, are usually 9 to 12, 9 to 11 books per foot. So let's say with a leather-bound book, you're using 8 per foot. And you figure out what it is. So there's eight books per foot. $20 a book. That's $160 a book, etc. You know, and I've had people come into me for 100 feet. And when you give them the deal, it, you know, it's hard. And getting them is not easy. You know, um, if you can find out in your area. Let me say this. I meant to tell you. I said it already. I'm not sure. Get in touch with house flippers. If you're looking for sources of, of all kinds of stuff. Every once in a while, a house flipper gets full houses of books and whatever. Um, but in terms, I, I lost my train of thought, but bringing it back to Bibles. Um, leather by the Yard. Leather by the Yard, thank you. Yeah, I found leather a website. Leather by the Yard is just that. You know, yeah, website, leatherboundbooks.com. Uh, they don't have any prices listed, but if you're looking for like collectible books, uh, leatherbound volumes, obviously, uh, sets. You can buy them from there because they don't list the price. I'm assuming it's quite expensive and they're trying to go after high ends, uh, doctors and lawyers and uh, people with very beautiful mansions to showcase. So there's, there's a market for almost anything. That's the fun yeah. part of this. Um, I'll, I'll just say, and then I'm going to steer the, the questions. If you guys have more, we'll drop them in. We're going to try and wrap this up in about 15 minutes or so. Um, you don't know what you don't know. And so before any of us sold books, we just saw books on shelves and thought, yeah, that's that's cool. Maybe I want a book for myself. We didn't think about reselling those on, on Amazon or eBay or anywhere. And after over time, you see somebody on YouTube, you see a friend doing it. You go, wait a minute, this is a real thing. And you start to develop an eye and understand what it is. When I was in high school, my brother and I were selling a bunch of stuff on eBay. And so we would go around and we saw a ton, like almost every Goodwill at the time, and some of them still do would have Polaroid cameras. And most of them were worthless, but we started developing an eye and understanding that there was a original collectible camera called the Land SX70. And we could sell those back on eBay. I don't know what they're going for now, but we could sell those for about 100 to $150. And we'd find them at garage sales for a dollar or two. And back then, I'm not as old as Steve, but I was making $5 an hour. And so to be able to find I found several of them over that summer because we knew what to look for. Uh, before, I would have just passed over Polaroids. But once I did that, I could sell those for the equivalent of 20 or 30 hours of work. And so what you're doing here is you're teaching your eye, you're teaching your brain to start looking for different things. And so some of the things that stand out based on what Steve's been saying is any popular author, especially fiction, Hemingway, James Joyce, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, if you see these authors and it's an older book, snag it. There's a good chance you can research it. You can look it up. Now you have the research and the tools to figure out if you know it's the first edition. All of a sudden, now you've got something valuable that you would have skipped over before. So here's here's my two questions selfishly since I'm running the interview. We find these books, Steve. Now, what do we do with them? So what's a great place? Can we send them to your Facebook group to like help with an appraisal? Can we pay you to get an appraisal? So how do we figure out for sure, is it worth money? And then the follow-up question is, where on earth do we sell these? How do we turn them into money? Okay. 
appraisals. I'm, you t- an appraisal to me is I created a legal document for a specific purpose. An evaluation is kind of what you're saying. Um, we can figure figure that out. You can send them into the vintage, rare, antique book group or any book group that you might be associated with that does, um, you know, in terms of the most important part of your question, where to sell them? Well, it depends on what the book is. If you have books that are in a couple, let's talk about the creme de la creme. Creme de la creme belongs at auction. But we're not talking about now. We're talking about normal times. Nobody knows what's going on. But if I had a decent book, like these medical books that we got, I did send 23 of them to auction and got $40,000 for them. You know, uh, as soon as things pick up again, I'll send more. I've got about 300 of them. Um, So auction is one thing. Online stores, eBay, any of those things, I, I... I don't do a lot of online selling. Um, I've got a pretty good client list when I find the right things. Right now, I'm not looking for anything but the right things, so to speak. Um, you know, and I would say an eBay store and on eBay. Um, 20 years ago, I used to love eBay. It was a man would sell this and that. Um, you know, it separates the wheat from the chase, so to speak. I mean, my first example on eBay was a book that I had at a book show in Baltimore. It was it was an odd bibliography of some German author by the Scarecrow Press, 1953, no Dutch. I would have sold that book. I had, I think, $18 on it. I was sold it for five. You know, if somebody bought it at the show, it was a book on books, so I brought it to an antique book show. I tried an experiment. At the bottom end, I put that one, and at the top end, I put in windows in that eBay experiment. That stupid little bibliography went for $113 because two guys, you know, literally Hawaii and New Zealand, I mean, some things you don't forget about it, but bid it out to $113. What a lesson that was. And the Chagall book went just what it should have gone for. So if it's somewhat the same and you can get a realistic price or protect yourself with a reserve, you know, eBay. Um, what, we, what I used to do was list books in the AB. You know, we can't do that anymore. But, you know, I mean, that's what I would say. And let me, let me say what you have done. What you have done, Caleb, to modern selling is absolutely amazing and I, I can see why so many people follow you, are loyal to you, subscribe to you. And, you know, we've known each other, you know, for a couple of years through Facebook, and you were a guest on my show before. Uh, I kudo to you, my friend. I mean, you know, meeting you now face-to-face instead of with the, you know, on radio we never met. Hats off to you. I wish you nothing but continued success that you're experiencing now. And if we can ever do this again, or if you guys have questions, it would be my pleasure. Other other questions? Yeah, we'll take some of those. I I really appreciate you coming on, Steve. We're supposed to do a book selling conference. We do a turn the page event. We're going to be down in Miami, theoretically in November, of course, with COVID and coronavirus. None of us are sure what uh, the world's going to look like in six months and whether travel will be up and moving uh, like it was just a couple months ago. But if we do, Steve, we'll actually we'll meet up. I want to I want to buy you a beer, or coffee or, or dinner or all of the above. And uh, we'll spend some time together, meet face to face. And we'll do one of these interviews in person as well. So appreciate your expertise. I will say what well, we'll go out on, right out this, we got the bay right out there. I can hear the birds chirping in the background. No, no, I said we got the bay right out the window. We could do it at the pool. Oh, beautiful. Thanks. Um, Thank you. So thanks for sharing your expertise. I do have one. Let me point one thing out. You see this little thing up here? That's a cigarette machine. You wind it up with the book facade. It plays smoke gets in your eyes and a little dog pops up and shoots a cigarette at you. That's called a blook. B-L-O-O-K. An object that looks like a book that's not. Go to Min Dupanksky's exhibit at the Gralia Club. It'll tell you what blooks are. One more question. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, People people were asking, and I'll I'll take this one and then get your advice as well. 
you know, where do we sell these books? Amazon, eBay, other sites. Amazon is not a great source for collectible books for a couple of reasons. One, they have a category called collectible, but it doesn't show up in search the same way that used and new books do. So when you list on Amazon, people are just going to miss over it. If you have a book that's signed by the author, if you list in the collectible category, it mostly gets hidden. We've listed hundreds of books there and our sell through rate, rate was abysmal. So if you have collectible, the audience that's, that's willing to pay and looking for those books is looking on eBay. The other benefit that you mentioned, Steve, on eBay, worst case, list a book for $10 at an auction. And if it's a thousand dollar book, you're going to attract attention and it's going to get sold for the fair market price because you've got an active market. If you're trying to sell that on Amazon and just list it for 10, there's no option for that to get bid up to the appropriate level. And you're potentially going to leave a lot of money on the table. So if you guys want to experiment, literally, it's not going to take a lot of your time. Take a big chunk of those books. If you don't even want to research them, that's fine. Take a nice photo of the outside, the spine, the back cover, the title page. Take a few photos, five or six, put them on eBay and list, list two or 300 books over the course of a weekend. And just see, put them all at auction, list them for a couple dollars plus shipping, just so you can at least make a little bit of money. And maybe you'll see which ones actually get attention, which ones get bid up, and then start to hone in. What were they? Who are the authors? Are they fiction or nonfiction? What age? And you're just going to build that, that knowledge base as you go. And worst case, you lose half a day and you don't make much money. That's okay. If you can, if you can stretch this muscle, if you can learn how to sell collectible books, that's going to open up a whole new world. And that's what we're all after is that thrill of the hunt and the dopamine hits of, of finding something valuable and then selling it. All right, Steve, my last question for you, then we'll let you go. You've been very generous with your thrill time. Of the hunt. Let, let me say one thing. Sure. I met my wife at a garage sale, the best thing I ever found in an estate sale. <laughs> but you have to go to the Aquarian book. God willing, everything opens up. That's your best source of education. Walk around an antiquarian book fair, talk to the dealers, see what they have on the shelves. Nothing finer a learning experience. Question, go ahead. Yeah, that'll train your eye quite a bit. All right, I sell a $800 book, Leather Bounds. How on earth do I ship this thing? We've talked about this before, but I think that's a good question to, to close up with. Did you say how to ship it, how to wrap it? Uh, yeah, how do I protect this thing? Because the post office is going to throw this in the air. So how, how do we protect this so it gets to the customer in one okay. piece? This is what I would do. This is what I would do. Let's pretend this is my $800 book. First thing I would do is I would wrap it in brown paper. After I wrapped it in brown paper, wrap it in bubble wrap. Then I will usually, I'm, I can either use a pre-fitted box, which I prefer not to. Steve? Or I would wind up, yeah, okay, here. Okay. Took the chewy box, repurposed it, packed it to the hilt with stuffing, you know. So there is no movement in this box. That's the key. No, I don't need anything else. Um, you know. What I do, and again, I don't do a lot of shipping. If I did, I'd be having everything, you know, uh, pre-formed, pre-cut and all of that. But give me a beer box, give me some brown paper and wrap and an X-Acto knife, which is always very close in all different colors and shapes. And I will whittle a beer box into a book box. It was the second thing my mentor taught me <laughs> for rare books uh, way back in the beginning. You know, the first one was how to use a white gum eraser to clean up a book. Never use anything but a white gum eraser on your pencil pricing and always erase in one direction. Final tip. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, Steve, our time has come to a close. Thank yeah. you very much for being generous. I know this is, uh, we've got a lot of happy people that are excited and are ready to go start looking for books. Guys, I put a link on, on YouTube and Facebook to Steve's Facebook group as well. Go there, say hello, reach out, start asking questions, and just start stretching this muscle when it comes to collectible and rare books. Steve, we hope to have you back on again in the future, and we'll talk at you real soon. Be a pleasure. All right. Bye My now. Pleasure. Later, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for the help earlier, too. Now I hope I know how to shut this off. <laughs>